You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. In this age of leadership, I'd like to talk if I can about what I regard as the mission of Jewish leaders in our time. Now, I'm not an American. I was born in South Africa, which is probably the only reason why I'm the only person in this room who does not have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> I left South Africa as a kid because I lived in a very, very Zionist home and I had a father who had a mission and he knew exactly where he wanted to send me. I'll never forget my father coming to me one morning when I was 16 years old, saying to me, Avram, goodbye. I said, Dad, where are you going? He said, I'm not, you are. <laughs> I said, where am I going? He said to me, you're a Jewish youngster, there's a Jewish state. Goodbye! <laughs> I really didn't want to come to Israel. I had this most amazingly gorgeous girlfriend. I didn't want to leave her. I wanted to stay in South Africa. I said, Abba, maybe I should go to university in South Africa, and then I'll go to Israel. And my father says to me, you're a Jewish youngster, there's a Jewish state. Goodbye! I said, but Abba, he says, it's because of her, right? I said, yeah, it's because of her. My father said to me, I promise you, if she really loves you, she'll follow you. I said, Dad, are you sure? He said, 100%. I've never seen her since. <laughs> it's not quite true, because a couple of years ago, I was in London, and I gave a talk, and I told the story, and I said, I've never seen her since. And she stood up in the audience after 40 years. She's changed unbelievably. <laughs> I know that I remained the way I was, but she changed. <laughs> and I go to live in Israel. So I'm not an American. I was born in South Africa, educated in Israel, lived my life in Israel. But in most of my professional work, I've been deeply connected with the American Jewish community. And one of the things which have really bothered me about the American Jewish community, and not only America, but most diaspora communities, but in America more than others, is the unique ease with which <coughs> American Jews and American institutions confuse their tasks with their missions. It's a very serious issue. I remember when I first came to this country, I came as a shaliach. I was the first community shaliach in 2,000 years of Jewish history. I get sent to the city of Baltimore, Maryland. I come to the city of Baltimore, Maryland. The executive director of the Federation gave me a beautiful office at the JCC, it was about three foot by three foot. I was thin in those days, I could fit into the room. I was in that room for about 15 minutes and there's a knock on the door. And I open a door and there's a gentleman standing out there who's a very well-known and distinguished and unbelievable Jewish leader. Many of you may have heard of him, Dr. Louis Kaplan. He was a member of the Board of Regents of the University of Maryland and the head of the Baltimore Hebrew College, a great Jewish educator. But he opened the door and he says to me, Shalom, are you Avram? I said, I am. He said, you're a Shaliach from Israel? I said, I am. He said, you're based at the JCC? I said, I am. He said, don't let me catch you doing any Jewish education. 
Jewish education is my responsibility, not yours. The JCC is recreation, not Jewish education. Oh, nothing could have got me more involved in Jewish education than that. <laughs> what is he talking about? Jewish education is his responsibility. What I've now learned is called in America the turf issue. Don't step on my turf. Jewish education is a turf issue. It's not an accident that the Torah commands us to appoint shoftim v'shotrim, judges and policemen. But nowhere are we commanded to appoint teachers. You know why? Because no Jew is exempt from the responsibility of being a teacher. And even education has become a turf issue. We deal in education and you don't, you dare do that. We confuse our mission with our tasks. It's not the mission of a rabbi to give a sermon. That may be his task. It's not the mission of the Jewish Federation to raise money. It may be the task of the Federation. It's not the mission of the Prime Minister of Israel to run the country. It may be his task. It's not the mission of a nursery school teacher in a Jewish nursery school to play with little Jewish children and teach them Jewish songs. It's their task, but it's not the mission. And we all turn our, mission, our task into a mission and we compete with each other over turf, over funding, over everything. If we only understood that we all shared a mission, but that what we all are responsible for is a particular task towards the same mission, we would have a very, very different Jewish community. And I want to share with you what I believe the mission of the Jewish people, whether it's the Prime Minister of Israel, or the nursery school teacher, or the Jewish Federation, or the JCC, or the teacher in the classroom, the mission is, how can we ensure the continued significant survival of the Jewish people? That's our mission. And don't think it's guaranteed. Even if our survival may be guaranteed, and I'm not sure it is, our significant survival is not guaranteed. Our understanding that it is a continued survival is not guaranteed. But that is our mission, whether it's the UJF, UJA, or the CJF, or whatever other alphabet name you want to give it, how do you ensure, perhaps I'll change it slightly, how do you ensure the continued survival and renaissance of the Jewish people? I said Jewish people, not the Jewish religion. I'm not going to go back and give the lecture that I gave the last time I was here. But Judaism is not a religion. The Jews are a people who have a religion. But we are first and foremost a people. Let me tell you of some of the most difficult questions I had to face as a Hitler president from very intelligent young students. Whenever I went to talk to students around the world, I always carried a chart with me. Can you see it? I brought it with me now. It's a chart. It's divided into three columns. Across the top, I've written the words apples, oranges, bananas. On the second line, I wrote lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers. On the third line, I wrote jackets, shirts, pants. 
On the fourth line, it says, Jew blank blank. And I ask Jewish students, in this country and elsewhere, fill in those blanks. And in this country, without exception, every time I did that exercise, the student, what is to an apple, what is to a Jew like an apple is to an orange, the students always said either Jew, Catholic, or Protestant, or Jew, Christian, Muslim. In other words, their self-understanding was that Judaism is a religion. So how am I supposed to answer their question when they say to me, what right does a religion have to a state? And they're quite right. No religion has a state. There are many states that have religions. But there's only one state that has a religion, and that's the Vatican. And that's why Mr. Arafat, you remember him? My good friend, out of the kindness of his heart, he suggested that he would give the Jews two square miles in Jerusalem, where they can have a Jewish Vatican with a Jewish Pope, or two Popes, an Ashkenazic Pope, and a Sephardic Pope. <laughs> Or three popes, a Catholic pope, I mean, a, uh, an Orthodox pope, a conservative pope, a reformed pope. But we don't deserve a Vatican. We have an independent state, a Jewish state, which is meant to be the homeland of the Jewish people. Because we are a people and we fail to teach our kids that we are a people, because we don't stick carefully to our mission. I have to tell you a story, because I love telling the stories. Anybody who's heard me speak has heard the story probably. Too bad, you're gonna hear it again, because I love hearing it. I remember the first time I flew to the United States of America. I came to Kennedy Airport. In those days, Kennedy Airport, El Al had its own terminal. It was called the Orange Terminal. I have no idea why. It was painted green. It took me two hours to find the place. <laughs> and the terminal was a room about three times the size of this room. And in this room, there were three booths. There was passport control. There was customs control. And there was Chabad control. <laughs> they looked exactly the same. I had no trouble with passport control. I had no trouble with customs control. I come to Chabad control and this little, little Lubavitcher says to me, excuse me sir, did you put on to fill in this morning? <laughs> in New York. You all know what to fill in are. That we put on for prayer, it's like an antenna to make sure we make a good connection. And then I suddenly thought to myself, what would happen if I would have said to him, Thank you so much for asking me to put on to fill in. I would love to try it. I've never put on to fill in in my life. It looks like a wonderful religious experience. I'm so glad you asked me to do it. My name is O'Reilly and I'm a Catholic priest. <laughs> How would this Chabadik respond? Don't touch, I wasn't talking to you, have a nice time, give us a trip. I was talking to him. But if I would have said to him, listen, get off my back. I can't stand you guys. I'm Israeli and I'm Jewish. I mean, I'm Jewish, but I don't believe in this nonsense. He'd follow me all the way to Israel until I put on those to fill in. <laughs> now, why? It's not because it is a beautiful, wonderful religious experience to put on to fill in. It's something that he thinks you're expected to do because you're a member of this people. And if you're not a member of this people, you're not expected to do it. Which is why we Jews have this wonderful concept, which is, by the way, I think one of the reasons for our existence in the world, although we're hated for it. We have this wonderful teaching which says, if you want to be a righteous human being, all you have to do is to keep seven laws, unless you're born Jewish. Then you're stuck with 613. <laughs> but think about that statement for a moment. You know what an amazing statement that is? It explains to me 
why every totalitarian government, every fundamentalist movement, always begins by getting rid of the Jews, or trying to get rid of the Jews. Because every totalitarian movement says, you have to be me to be right. Come the Jews and says, I have to be me to be right. You don't have to be me to be right. If you want to create a totalitarian world, you better get rid of the Jews. Because we are living there as a reminder of anti-totalitarianism. I love being a part of this people. The symbol of anti-totalitarianism in this world. You don't have to be me to be right, but know who I am. I'm a member of a people. Why don't we teach that to our kids, my friends? Why do the kids keep telling me Protestant, Catholic, Jew? Why do they think that we're just a religion? I'm not anti-religious people. I go to shul every day of my life. But I do it because I'm a member of a Jewish people. When a Jew stands before God, he doesn't stand as an individual. He stands as a member of his people. That's the first item of our mission. Remembering that we are a people and educating that we are a people and letting people know that we are a people. Ah, we're a people. In the world after modern nationalism, there's no way you can remain a people if you do not have a state in which your people are sovereign. And that's why Israel. I get a very weird feeling sometimes when I visit federations and Jewish communities around the world. I get the feeling that people think, that Jews think, they were created in order to support Israel. <laughs> Can I remind you that Israel was created in order to support the Jewish people, not the other way around. The state of Israel was created in order to ensure the continued significant survival of the Jewish people. That's why we better support Israel. Because Israel's very purpose in life is to ensure the very mission that I've been talking about. Israel doesn't always remember that. Well, they should be reminded. And it's our continued survival. We did not begin with a Holocaust. We didn't even begin with the creation of the state of Israel. I have another story I'd love to tell. I come from a long line of very famous physicists. I have an uncle who was one of the creators of the Sputnik. I have a cousin who's the head of the Department of Physics at Oxford University. And the day that I was born, my father, my late father knew that I am going to be the world's greatest physicist. Einstein, nothing compared to my father's dreams about me. So I went, I went to study eventually at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I went to study physics. And the first day that I was sitting in the physics lab, I was looking out of the window. And I saw this gorgeous young lady from New Jersey, Jersey walking across to the history department. So I graduated in history instead of in physics. <laughs> She's now the grandmother of my 16 grandchildren. She thinks we're 15. I know we're 16 because I count my married, my grandson's wife as a grandchild. So it's... Now I've got to explain this to my father. He's waiting for me to put Einstein out of business. So I write my father a letter. I said, Abba, 
I've decided to devote my life to the study of Jewish history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And my father sends me, we didn't have emails in those days, he sends me a telex. And in this telex he says, he was furious. Not at me anymore, he'd forgotten about me being a physicist. He was mad at the Hebrew University. He said, what, the Hebrew University teaches Jewish history? Are they crazy? There is no such thing as Jewish history. Jews do not have history. Jews have memory. I had no idea what he was talking about then. Today, I can tell you he's 100% right. What's the difference between history and memory? History is knowing what happened in the past. Memory is asking yourself, who am I in light of what happened in the past? What does what happened in the past mean in determining who I am today? That's the purpose of Jewish education, by the way. Jewish education is not teaching kids how to read a language they don't understand. We spend billions over the years on how to teach children to read a language they don't understand. I've never heard of anything more stupid. The purpose of Jewish education is how do you take a single individual and attach his personal memory to the collective memory of this people. Because if you're a Jew who lives with a Jewish memory, everything in Jewish life takes on meaning. Israel, God, Mount Sinai, Hebrew, taking care of each other. All of that is a part of Jewish memory. When do we tell this to our kids that it's memory? Memory of a significant people. And then I said, to ensure the continued significant survival of the Jewish people. The second question I was bothered about by students <coughs> on campus, believe me, they're sincere in asking this question. And they don't find very many good answers. I spend my life talking about how important it is to ensure the survival of the people. You know it's important to ensure the survival of the people. But what happens to me is when I have a kid who's a chutzpahdy kid, and he says to me, why? <coughs> why? And he's not attacking me. And he's not being an anti-Semite. And he's not being ignorant. He's sincerely asking. Why the survival of this Jew, of this people? Do we ever offer them serious answers? I've never met a kid who thought it's enough to remain Jewish in order to get a quarter of a roast chicken on Friday night. They're looking for meaning. They want to know that there is a reason. And I think we have a reason. The oldest prayer of our tradition talks about the Alenu. We say it in every service, morning, afternoon, and night. The Taken Olam the Malchut Shaddai. The role and the purpose of this people is to make this a better world. And what an exciting and true message that is. What a significant thing that is. You saw what we did in Haiti. 
I'm proud of our ability in Tikkun Olam. But if Israel is a Jewish state, it's to do it in the name of the Jewish people, together with the entire Jewish people. It'll rebuild the relationship between Israel and the diaspora. It'll make it meaningful. And it will make our lives as Jews significant. There are challenges we face carrying the diaspora. This confusion of mission and task is a challenge. Carrying the diaspora, getting Jews to remain Jews, is not easy. We're all involved and we all hear about this issue of the conversion bill. That's going to be passed in Israel. And will probably pass, and I hope not, frankly. What is this nonsense of conversion to Judaism? You convert to a religion, you can't convert to a people. The big debate going on is, who's the rabbi who converts the person who wants to become Jewish? The issue is not who converts them. The question is, what are they joining? I'm now on a personal crusade around the world. People get rid of that word conversion. If you want to use the Hebrew word giyur, giyur does not mean conversion. The Hebrew word giyur comes from the verb lagur, to live with, to tie your lot with. You can be adopted by a people, but you can't convert to a people. And if people are willing to seriously tie their lot with the Jewish people, we should learn to embrace them. There is a phrase in Judaism called conversion. You can't convert to becoming a Jew, but you can convert out of Judaism. And there the word they use is hamara, which means conversion. Yehudi mumar. Someone who's born a Jew, he becomes something else, he has converted. He may think he's a Catholic. <laughs> According to Jewish law, he's called a Yehudi Mumar, a converted Jew. And somebody who joins this people, just like in every single family in this world, is an adopted child, and you don't keep reminding people that they're adopted. Someone who converts to Judaism is not a converted Jew, but a Jew. You're forbidden by halakha, by halakha to remind a Jew that they're a convert. These are amazing challenges for the future of the people. Because what is it that we've said for the last two generations to our kids? We want you to become just like the non-Jew. We want you to go to their universities. We want you to outgoy them in sports and in everything. Be better than they are in everything goish. Just don't marry them. We never told our kids that we we're a different mishpocha altogether. And then if you want to marry somebody from outside, make sure that they become a part of this mishpocha. They become part of this family. We're just not another religion. And it is so important, it is so deep. And language affects the way in which we function. Language affects the way in which we function. 
Every time we use the word converted in relationship to someone becoming Jewish, you're making the statement Judaism is a religion and therefore you're telling a lie. Let's stop using that word. Jews, remember that you are first and foremost an ethnic, an ethnic. But for us, our ethnic has always got to be tempered by our ethic. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM. Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. And we thank you for your kind support.